If you have your Bible, would you go with me today to Psalm chapter 1 verse 1. And Psalm chapter 1 verse 1 is a very famous Psalm that a lot of people have had it memorized. And it says the following, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. I read this and I'm like, so what do I do? I can't stand, I can't sit and I can't walk. I am sorry David, I can't fly. <laughs> so David says, don't sit, don't stand and don't walk. Okay, so what do I do? Well, thank God for the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, in Ephesians, if you go to Ephesians chapter 2, let's open our Bibles. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6, it says, And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Mm. So David says, don't sit. And Paul says, you have been seated in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. Come on, this will make about this shout. This is amazing. And if you go to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1, it says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So David tells us, don't walk in this particular way. Paul tells us, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Are you with me? David tells us in Psalm 1, 1, he says, don't stand. In Ephesians chapter 6, let's scroll just a few pages. Ephesians chapter 6, or if you are reading an, through an app, you can just scroll down. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. I want to summarize Christian life today in three words. If you ever wondered what does it mean to be a Christian? If you're visiting our church and you're not a Christian and you wonder what does it mean to be a Christian and if your version is they're homophobic, you know, transphobic, dinosaurs, bigoted, anti-abortion. That is not what it means to be a Christian by the way. Trump loving Republican voting. That is not what Christianity is. Okay? Christianity is really summarized in three words. It's sitting, it's walking, and it's standing. And that's what I want to break today down for us. Sitting represents our position in Jesus Christ that a Christian currently has. Walking represents a practice that a Christian has in walking things out in their world, with their family, with their work, with their friends, with their social life. Standing represents the posture that a Christian has in the spiritual warfare at the same time as they are walking and they are sitting. Sitting speaks of our belief system. Walking represents our behavior. And standing speaks of our battle. And Ephesians goes through three of these phases or three of these parts of what it means to be a Christian. Let's touch on each one of them briefly. Sitting. The Bible says you are seated in the heavenly places. Now the verse I've read in Ephesians chapter 2, the verse before that Paul says that we have been raised with Christ. If you remember a few weeks ago, I shared a message what I highly encourage you to listen to. It's called the living dead, where I've shared in that message that Jesus died for you and you died with him on the cross. And not only you died with Jesus, you were buried with Jesus, you were raised with Jesus. And that's why we get baptized because we identify with Jesus's death. That's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. Jesus wasn't crucified for me. He died for me. But I was crucified with Jesus. 
So that means I don't look forward to dying, to being set free from the old man. I look backwards to his death to be reminded of the deliverance from the power of the old man. But Ephesians goes one step further. It says, not only I've been crucified with Jesus, meaning my current identity as a Christian is not hanging on the cross. My current identity as a Christian is not even being raised with Jesus and walk in the newness of life. My current identity with Jesus is being seated. Because in 1 John it says, as He is, so are we in this world. It doesn't say as He was, as He is, so are we in this world. What is Jesus right now? He's not on a cross. He's not roaming on the earth in newness of life. He is seated at the right hand of God, above principality, above powers. He is at the place of rest. And the Bible says as a Christian, you are not just identifying with Jesus with His death, burial, resurrection. You are identifying with Jesus also with Him being seated in the heavenly places. Come on somebody. Now, this would seem at first that's why I believe we will go to heaven, because we're technically already there. I don't doubt that I will go to heaven. Why? I'm already technically there. In Christ, who is where? In heaven. Christians don't live for heaven, they live out of heaven. They're seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is who you are. That is where you are seated. That is your spiritual place right now. And that is incredible. Above principality, above the powers of this world and of this age. It's interesting that when God created Adam, God's day of rest was the next day. So Adam's first day on this earth was God's day of rest. Being created, Adam steps next day into, so what do I do? And God says, you rest with me. Creation was, was happening on God's last day. When God saves us, guess what we step into? We step into Christ and Christ is seated. We step into the place, into the position of God's grace and into the position of the finished work of Jesus. We are in Jesus and He is seated. Therefore, spiritually, you're supposed to be seated. That is what Christians believe is that they are in Jesus seated. Now, we live in a culture today where you can identify yourself with something that is not factually true. There are people who identify themselves as particular animals. For example, like a person, um, I watched one documentary, identifies themselves as a wolf. So they go to school and they, they howl as a response to the teacher. And they are convinced that they are a wolf. Now, for, for those of us who are believers, we understand that you can identify yourselves with whatever you want, but if it's not grounded in reality, it's deception. It, it's, it's delusion. It, it, is, it, is, it could be a disorder. It could be a demon. But you, you, you can identify yourself with whatever you want, but if it's not grounded in reality, it's not, not going to work. So we don't identify ourselves with Jesus to make it real. Jesus makes it real to give us the opportunity to be identified with Him. It's kind of like getting a license. You cannot get a license if you're not an individual. You can have an ID only after you are a person. So your identification with Jesus only because there is a person named Jesus who loves you, who died for you, who has given you access to the Father, who is the way, the truth and life and He allows you to be included in Him as the Adam allowed Him to be, for you to be included in Adam. And you have died with Him, you were crucified with Him and that you were risen with Jesus and now you are seated with Jesus. In Ephesians, it talks about 14 different benefits that a Christian has through Christ. It says we're blessed in Christ with every, every spiritual blessing. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. It says we're chosen before the foundation of the world. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. It says we've been redeemed through the blood in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. 
It says that we obtained an inheritance, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. It says that because we're seated, we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. It says that because of Jesus, we've been made alive together with Christ, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5. It says we've been saved by grace, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5. We've been raised up with Christ, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. As I mentioned, we've been seated with Him in the heavenly places, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. We've been created in Christ for good works, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20. We've been brought near by the blood of God, by the blood of Jesus to God, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13. We have access to the Father, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18. We're citizens, saints, members, heirs, bride, body and God's building in Christ, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19. We're loved by Christ, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 19, Ephesians chapter 5, 2 and 5. 25. That's, that's 14 things I've mentioned only for one book of Ephesians that you have. You're pretty wealthy. I'm not sure what you, maybe you're constantly reminded about what you don't have. I want to tell you about who you, who you belong to. And because you belong to Jesus, the Bible says you're, you're in the cultural terminology loaded. You're filled with the riches in Jesus. Now I know your reaction will be like, well, th that's great Vlad. I don't feel it. The Bible never says for you to feel it. The Bible tells us to know it. And it's, you shall know the truth, not you shall feel the truth. When you know the truth, the truth begins to set you free. You are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I love that, that David tells us where not to sit and Paul tells us where we are seated. I want to highlight one part about this. You don't sit down. You get seated. The Bible never says a phrase to seat yourself in Christ. You can't do that. The Bible doesn't even tell us to get into Christ. That is not something you and I can do by any merits or works. The Bible tells us to abide in Christ, indicating it's a fact you're already in Him as a Christian. The Bible introduces us from the beginning, you are seated. It doesn't say, hey, this is Jesus like a chair, sit down. It says, this is Jesus, you're already seated. So we operate from the fact of the reality that the scripture says is the truth that we don't have to sit down, we don't try to sit down, we don't believe ourselves into sitting down, we don't do mental gymnastics to think ourselves seated, we are seated. And from the place of seated, we think ourselves, we consider ourselves, we reckon ourselves, we view ourselves, but it's an established fact, you are seated in Jesus Christ. If the Old Testament tells us not to sit down, the New Testament tells us we are seated. An accomplished fact. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. I don't have to try to sit down. I receive as a fact. Amen. Jesus is the identity for every believer. Now, that is the first thing is that we are seated. Somebody say seated. Somebody dropped it in the chat. Seated in Christ. A place of rest, a place of no work, a place of grace and it's a posture and a place of, that I occupy right now in the spiritual realm. In fact, not in the spiritual realm but in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus. And I live from the place of heaven on earth. I live from Christ into life. Not into, not trying to get into Him. He already by mercy and grace placed me in Jesus and that is so beautiful. The step number two and this is also very important and we need to address this is walking. Somebody say walking. Now Paul tells us walking few things. In Ephesians chapter 2 he was talking about make sure that we don't walk as he says but once you walked according to the course of this world, meaning you lived like the world. And he says, we, we don't do that anymore. And then a little bit later, he says, God created us for good works, which in which we have to walk in. Meaning God doesn't save us 
by good works, He saves us for good works and wants us to walk in those good works. If you go to Ephesians chapter 4, you will see that walk worthy of your calling. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17, it says that no longer should we walk like Gentiles in the futility of their mind, having their heart being darkened. Meaning we shouldn't walk like the world walks. In Ephesians 5 2, He says walk in love. In Ephesians 5 8, it says walk as children of the light. And in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15 it says walk in wisdom so if you are seated that's my position in Jesus my practice is walking Psalm says don't walk like the world I want you to notice the Bible commands us to walk it doesn't say we are walking meaning because of Jesus, you have all you need to walk, but it is a choice to actually do walk. I'll give an example. For the last 68 days, me and my wife have been walking. What I mean by that is that we made a decision. There was few other things that happened partially of the messages that I'm sharing with you that made a big impression scripture in my life and I felt there's certain things that need to go out of my life and certain things need to come in and one of those things that need to go out um, is too much sitting on the couch and watching things that are potentially the inter entertainment has two words in it called enter and then whatever the enter you because it enters you through your eyes and when you are sitting not in Christ but on the couch and you're not walking you're allowing things to enter you no wonder in Ephesians Paul says if you're allowing anger and all of these things he says that you're giving open door to the devil and you're grieving the Holy Spirit so what we started to do is say okay what if we make a decision every night we would go for a 10 minute walk and so faithfully with ex exception maybe one or two nights we have practiced walking now up to this point 68 days before that it's not that I couldn't walk and not that walking is exhausting or walking afterwards I'm like I oh, can't take it anymore I'm just so tired it's not like biking it's not like hiking it's not like flying it's not doing something supernatural in fact walking is extremely restful if your legs are not broken and if you have them now if you don't have legs walking is impossible if your legs are broken walking is painful but because of Jesus you are seated in Jesus you have legs meaning you have a new nature you have the Spirit of God which is like powers your new desires so to walk out to work it out to live it out is not hard to live a Christian life is just like walking it's not hard if you are a Christian It's not hard to score three pointers for Steph Curry. It's very hard for me. I don't even have a basketball in my house. My dad is not a basketball player. I don't play basketball. I don't practice basketball. Every once in a while I, I join a basketball where they play and for me to score, if my life would be dependent on scoring three point shots every single time, I will be burning in hell today because I am not a basketball player so for me to be good at playing basketball comes difficult when you are born again Christian to practice righteousness comes as natural because you're empowered by the Spirit of God that's why the Bible doesn't say to strive it says to stride it says walk walk but you can be seated and not walking but there are people who are trying to walk the Christian life who have never experienced the seated Christian life. You come to church and you're like, oh, I know what it means to be a Christian. Read the Bible, pray fast, don't do anything bad. No, you can't walk. You don't have legs. You will get hurt tomorrow. Christian life is not being living righteous. Christian life is being righteous. 
and you do that through your belief, repentance in Jesus, being in Jesus, you become the basketball player. So when now God throws you a ball, you can shoot it into three pointers and if you miss it, you're going to practice more. Why? Because it's who you are. Your light, your soul, you a new person. So to live a Christian life for a Christian is normal as walking. So when we would take walks, you know, for the last 68 days, I've noticed a few things that, you know, it's not hard to walk. It is just hard to make a decision to walk. Right? But the actual walking part, it's not like, I, I don't come out of it, I'm like drenched in sweat, broken, tired, exhausted, calling, you know, an emergency, please come and please pick me up, resuscitate me back to life because I, I can't take this anymore. In fact, when I finish my 10, sometimes 30 minute walk, I feel better, I feel refreshed. I lost 10 pounds. So I'm like, man, I'm signing me up for that diet. I feel closer to my wife. Because when I walk, I am now more engaged with her instead of sitting and letting whatever is entering me from over there enter me. So that's exactly what Christian life walking is. It's not hard if you're a Christian. So if it's hard for you, I want to ask you an honest question. Not are you a church person. Have you been born again? Has there been a new nature? that wants to do good. And if you are born again, have you believed what the Bible teaches about you? Or you still think the Christian life is about doing? It's about sitting first. God doesn't expect people to walk who have not sat. The church will, God won't. Because He knows it will be equivalent to asking Vlad to participate in a basketball championship. I will embarrass myself, my family, my church and my God. Because I'm not a basketball player. My dad was not a basketball player. I don't own a basketball. That's not who I am. To expect a person who has not been born again, seated in Jesus, to walk in love, in wisdom, not like the world. It's, it's not difficult, it's abuse, it's wrong, it won't work. We can't do it. But we will try to, to only realize we need some kind of a, we don't need a therapist, we need a regeneration. This thing is so messed up, it can't be fixed, it needs to be killed. And then I need to die with Jesus and be risen with Jesus, accept Jesus, be in Jesus. And then now I can, let me try this. Ah, got it. Why? Because the new creation in me is empowered by the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me, makes it possible to live a Christian life for the glory of God. Come on somebody, give God some praise right now. As you begin to walk, now I want to mention something about that Charles Spurgeon said this, the grace of God does not, that does not change my life will not save my soul. So many people we have today are seated but they do not want to walk and they will be like me pretty much just like hey I just want to be you're a Christian couch potato you don't want to walk out maybe your Christian life meaning you don't make priorities to read the word and this is not about salvation this is about walking out because you're not only living in heaven you're also living among your co-workers among your family you're, you're also living on this earth and this life on this earth the Bible says should be walked walking Christian life is a walk but Christian life is not physical, practical Christian life is not seated, it's walking. Spiritual Christian life is being seated in the heavenly places. As you walk, two things will happen. You will close the door to demons and secondly, you will open door to the intimacy with the Holy Spirit. If you don't walk, I'm not saying God will love you less. I'm not saying that what I, what's going to happen is this, is you will gain unnecessary weight, burdens, struggles that will come in not because God deemed it so it's because you've been entering everything else been entering you that had no business entering you you became a place for things that are not supposed to be a place for demons uh, scorpions snakes and these demonic things Paul made it very specific in Ephesians meaning you open your life exposed to the enemy and secondly you uh, you close your life to the Holy Spirit 
Yes, and you can brag about the fact, oh, but I'm still a Christian. I can do whatever I want. The grace covers me. But the Bible says in Titus, the grace of God that saves us, teaches us to deny ungodliness, teaches us to look forward to Christ. If the grace of God did not change your life, I really have a right to question whether it really saved your soul. Because if you've truly been seated, you got legs, my sister. You got legs, my brother. And God says, take a walk every single day. Walk your Christian life in how you speak to your husband. Walk your Christian life in how you speak to your wife. Walk your Christian life how you speak to your employees, how you speak to your co-workers. Walk your Christian life in what you do on Sunday morning. And the Bible made it very clear, don't walk like the world. Meaning if all the people do in the world do it like that, you want to be safe? Do the opposite. Why? Because you're a saved person. You're a new creation. Is everybody still with me? What does it mean to be a Christian? It's what? First is what? What is the second one? It's walk. And now let's go to the third one and we'll be done. It is to stand. And this is the posture of a battle. It is to stand. Now I want to highlight three things that we need to stand in or in this standing. It involves number one, to stand when the hell breaks loose. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13, it says that to stand on the evil day and to withstand that evil day. When I think of an evil day, I think when hell breaks loose. Have you ever had those days where everything that could go wrong goes wrong? And you're like, this can't get worse. And then it does. And you're like, and we still have three hours and then you still got that one text message that came at the end of like, like a cherry on the top of a cake. What is that? Evil day. It's when the hell breaks loose. And usually what we tend to do is we're like, why is this happening to me? And the Bible doesn't give us the answer to why. It tells us what we should do in that moment. Not to walk, to stand. That means you just entered a third phase of what it means to be a Christian. You entered into war. It's better to be a warrior in the garden than a gardener in war. And the problem with many Christians is while they're walking, they're taking this evening walk with the, with the Lord, living for Jesus. I'm just loving Jesus. And then you got shot out of nowhere. You're like, who would hate a person like me? I mean, I'm not a threat to anybody. Why are they shooting at me? Wait, is there a sniper somewhere? Fiery darts? That's equivalent to a modern day sniper. Meaning somebody is shooting from a distance. So the second thing after hell breaks loose, the second thing and that is, is when you get long shots from somewhere, meaning these demonic thoughts that come out of nowhere and you just get bombarded with persuasive, with convincing, with these very compulsive, with this pushy, condemning, doubting, fearful, intimidating, anxious, depressing, comparative. Can I go on? I think that's enough. Thoughts. That's the thoughts. These thoughts, they're so strong and they're so powerful. So the hell breaks loose. It's you're like, you're realizing, whoa, something is happening. Now, when it continuously does that after you've taken your stand, you might need deliverance. But if you're walking with Christ and it occasionally happens, the Bible says right away, take your posture as a warrior. You are a warrior. You are equipped. Yes, you're walking in a danger zone, but you're also a dangerous person because you have the Spirit of God living inside of you. God's angels are surrounding you. God's armor is upon you. And you're not just in danger zone. You are a dangerous person to the enemy. Do not fear, child of God. Do not fret, child of God. Do not flee child of God. Do not fall child of God. Do not run. Don't sit. Stand your ground. You will withstand the hell that came against you. You will withstand the valley that, that you are going through. You will withstand the fire that came against you. Stand your ground. If you don't know what to do, stand. If you prayed your prayer, stand. If you read the scripture, confessed it, named it, claimed it, blabbed it, grabbed it, stand. What do I do, Vlad? Stand your ground. My kids are not coming back to God. My health is not improving. It seems the hell is breaking loose. Stand right in the middle of it. You are a warrior in the garden. You are not a gardener in war. You're a mighty man, a mighty woman of God. Stand your ground. Somebody shout, stand. Come on, somebody shout, stand. But what happens if you get shot with fiery darts? You also stand, but this time you extinguish fiery darts. 
The Bible says extinguish, put out those fiery darts. And what does that mean? That means you're, you're standing and usually this is what happens. Hell breaks loose and then your thoughts begin to come against you. You did something wrong. God is punishing you. It's because of what this, that, this, that. And you begin to think, well, why this is happening? What did I do? Why? Because you're being shot. Not only you're in the place of hell breaking loose, now there are snipers and you don't know where they're coming from. And the Bible doesn't say run. The Bible doesn't say hide. The Bible doesn't say get down. The Bible doesn't say dodge bullets. It says extinguish, quench. That's not from God. That's not from me. You extinguish. If there will be a smoke, we have fire extinguisher. And we bring every single thing down. That's exactly what God wants you to do. In the moment when hell breaks loose, usually your mind comes under a heavy attack of demonic thoughts. Do not accept them as your own. Do not allow them to come inside and say, oh, this is just the way I think about me. No, no, no. This is the way the devil thinks about you. And he's shooting at you because you're most vulnerable when hell is breaking loose because now he can shoot you. Anytime you're in a place where you're like, I don't know where this is coming from. I'll tell you where it's coming from. A spiritual sniper somewhere on the mountain shooting at you. And Paul warned us, fiery darts will come. That's why he says your Christian life is not only enjoying your position in Christ. It's not only the world enjoying God's presence through you, but you practicing your Christian life. He says there will be a component people don't like to talk about. And this component is going to be your posture when hell breaks loose and you start getting shot from everywhere. Paul does not say that a Christian should take in bullets. He says the Christian should extinguish these fiery shots. And then he tells us one more thing. He says have a sword. A sword is for a close combat. The sword that he used in this, in the context, is actually not a long sword. It's a short dagger. You only use that sword if somebody comes very close. So while I cannot take out the sniper out there because I don't see him, I can catch and stop those and say, no, that, that is not. If God tells me that this is why this is happening, if God points that I'm going to believe, if a mentor or a person that God sends in my life, but if this is my own mind playing mind tricks, I'm not going to allow that. Why? Because I'm seated, I'm walking and I'm standing. But there's a third one and this one is heavy. And this is when, when the devil gets within a very close proximity and you actually feel him breathing on your neck. People sometimes say that. They feel that in the house. They feel a presence. Something that, it happened with the temptation of Jesus. The devil wasn't shooting from another planet. He was very close. In that moment, you have a dagger. Dagger is for a close combat. You don't just take the blame. You don't take the presence. You don't yield to that demonic presence. You don't fumble. You don't trip. You don't fall. The Bible doesn't say, and the dagger is your pastor's phone number. The Bible says the dagger is the Word of God. That means when it gets close, you have to create a combat situation. Not run. The Bible says resist him and he will flee. That means the devil doesn't have a defense system for the weapons were given to you. There is nothing he can do against that dagger that you have. So when hell breaks loose, stand your ground. If the stuff starts being shot at you, extinguish, extinguish, extinguish. And when the battle gets close, if he has the audacity to come and starts breathing on your neck, Dagger. We, and then just, 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 and call the ushers to pick him up. <laughs> no, maybe let him just fall. Just kidding. Uh, Joe is not the devil, by the way. He's the man of God. Just want to make it clear. I don't want all of you to start going expressing your anger against the devil today. Like, let me, you know, I've excused the devil. Let me just take my opportunity to avenge my, my, my thing on Joe. Do not do that. Are you with me? 
spiritual warrior in the garden. Christian life, I believe, a lot of time is just enjoying His presence. A lot of time is just people enjoying the peace of God that comes through us. Us walking in the beauty of holiness, uh, walking in righteousness. But there are moments where Christian life becomes war. And maybe you came here today and you brought this war with you. I want to tell you something, you came to the right place. God wants to bring you freedom, deliverance and salvation. I want you to rise to your feet. Martin can grab a microphone and help me with something right now. Church, before I give a call for salvation, I do feel like God wants to liberate some people today. Amen. And I want you, I'm just going to lead you in about a few prayers. We're just going to pray together. And if there is anything that maybe you have picked up or you came with and um, God can set you free right now addiction, uh, demonic presence, maybe some kind of an intrusion, uh, sexual dreams, uh, constant sicknesses that you cannot find a solution for, anxiety and depression that is not normal, that it, they cannot just go away, phobias and fears. God can set you free from today in Jesus' name. Just say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus wash, me with your blood. wash me with your blood. I believe, I believe. You, are my Savior, you are my Savior and you are my victor. Deliver me today. Deliver me today. Say this with me. Say any chain, any, chain, any, witchcraft, any witchcraft, any demonic covenant, any demonic covenant every, abuse, every abuse, every demonic soul tie, every demonic soul tie any, demonic agreement, any demonic agreement that Satan might have used, that Satan might have used to connect me to, connect me to, himself, to himself be broken. Be broken. Be broken, be broken in Jesus name. In Jesus. Come on open up your lips right now begin to just pray right now begin to break every demonic agreement, every demonic soul tie, maybe some kind of a covenant, some kind of an abuse that has been used again. Just open up your lips say I just break that right now. Jesus. Come on if you're a Christian be engaged. This is your moment to be a warrior. Don't depend on somebody else's prayers. Depend on your own right now. Depend on the Word of God. Let's begin to break that in Jesus mighty name. Yes, Father, we say this with me. Say that chain, that chain, the chain of affliction, the chain of affliction, the chain of torment, the chain of torment, the chain of addiction, the chain of addiction, the chain of sickness, the chain of sickness. Be, broken. be broken in Jesus' name. In Jesus Come on, name. begin to break that chain right now. Yes, break it, Father, in the name of Jesus, every chain every demonic agreement in our life will begin to break it over our lives those things that are demonic the fiery darts the snag us the, the begin to bind us the chains the grip of satan we break it in the mighty name of jesus depression anxiety suicidal thought lustful thoughts addiction father gambling addictions lord smoking addiction addiction to pornography addiction to masturbation addiction to gambling to gaming in the name of jesus we break those things in our lives in the name of jesus every chain of the enemy be broken broken over our mind, over our family, over our marriage, over our finances, over our health, everything that has to do with us in Jesus' mighty name. The Bible says about one of the David's men, his name was Shama. It says, when Philistines attacked the field of beans. If you have the scripture, Lisa, could you give that to us? The Bible says that he stood his ground. He defended that field and killed off the enemy. And that's really what it means to stand, is that you are, the Bible says, and after him was Shama, the son of Igi, the Herod, Herodite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines, the next verse. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it, and killed the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. You want a victory, you have to station yourself in the middle of your field. And then you have to defend that field. And sometimes that's what it takes is you take the Word of God and you begin to declare and decree God's Word and you resist the enemy. And then God brings victory. Victory will never happen when you run for a Christian. Victory only happens when you stand. Let everybody else run. People run from their marriages. They give up in their health. They give up for their, on their family. They give up on their walk with God and they say, oh, I'm under attack. I run. Hopefully God will do something. That's not what Shama did. Shama says, you can run. You can fold. You can fall. I will position myself because not only I am seated in Christ, not only I walk in Christ, but I also stand in Jesus Christ. I will defend my field of health. I will defend my field of 
spiritual finances. I will defend my field of spiritual freedom. I will defend my field of mental health. Why? Because it is my field that God wants me to defend and God will bring a great victory. I want you to pray one more prayer with me. Say, that evil spirit, that evil spirit affecting, my health, affecting my health, affecting my marriage, affecting my marriage attacking my finances, attacking my, finances attacking, my business, attacking my business, attacking my career, attacking my, career my spiritual life, my, spiritual life, my emotional life, my, emotional my, life, mental, life, my mental life, out, 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 out 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 right now right now in Jesus name in Jesus name come on place your hand up on your heart right now let me pray for you father in the name of Jesus I thank you for the authority that you have given to us as your ministers I break off everything that's demonic anything that's not of Jesus any fiery dart that has been attached to the son and daughter of yours I break it off right now a spirit of addiction any kinds of affliction that is demonically afflicted any kind of demonic persuasive convincing voice I break it off right now in Jesus name spirit of fear you have to go spirit of witchcraft you have have to go every spirit of heaviness you have to go every spirit of distress and anxiety you have to go every spirit of infirmity you have to go every spirit of fear and phobia you have to go in Jesus name be free in Jesus name be free in the name of Jesus thank you Lord thank you Lord hey thanks for watching this video if you enjoyed this content and this was a blessing to you would you help us and hit thumbs up so that it could help more people to discover this video. It costs you nothing, but it can go a long way to help with the algorithm. As well as if you're not subscribed to our channel, hit subscribe, click on the bell so that you can be reminded each time that we upload videos. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. If you're interested in learning more about Hungry Gen, our internship, our conferences, deliverance, and so many other things, go to hungrygen.com for more information. And as always, remember, better is not good enough, the best is yet to come.